and welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg, and today's episode is brought to you by our featured patron, Globula. Thank you, Globula. Today, we're going to be talking about Warren G. Harding. Now, there were several things in Warren G. Harding's life that you could argue were bad ideas. Yeah, considering many historians think of him as, like, the worst president we've ever had. More scandal-laden and more just completely ridiculous than any other. We will get to that. That's actually sort of the conclusion of this. This is what he earns for all of his trouble that we're going to go through. But I want to talk about maybe some of the more personal problems that he had that you may not have heard of and how they almost wrecked his presidential campaign and almost wrecked the Republican Party in how they had to deal with them. In 1920, Warren G. Harding wasn't the man that most people expected to become president. In fact, they didn't even expect him to be nominated. Despite his regal look and his celebrated speaking ability, he had done poorly in the Republican primaries, and as he entered the 1920 Republican National Convention, he was considered to be something of a dark horse in the race for the nomination. But luckily for Harding, the men ahead of him were trapped in a deadlock. There were scandals, there were factions. Everyone who had a decent portion of support from the delegates at the convention was hated by enough of the other delegates that nobody could decide on who actually should become the nominee. And then, Senator Reed Smoot, yes, that is his real name. I love some of the names we get to find sometimes. I didn't even talk about it last week. One of the people in the cabal against Grenier was named DeSilly. (laughs) The silly. <laughs> De silly. This man would go on to be involved in another bad idea, by the way, Tony. We haven't covered this one yet, but the smoot Holly tariffs are widely regarded as one of the worst economic decisions the government ever made in the United States. He's not there yet, though. Right now, he just supports Warren G. Harding. And as a Warren G. Harding supporter, he starts a rumor that the Republican leadership has met behind closed doors and secretly decided to promote Harding to be the nominee. This is not true. This is something Smoot just makes up, but he tells a newspaper, oh yeah, a bunch of us real high important people sat down and we decided uh, all this infighting is bad for us. We, we need to get together behind somebody who can everybody can support, and I think that person's Warren G. Harding. And despite the fact that it's not true, The fact that he says that it's true gets all of the delegates at the convention thinking about Harding in a different way. And they're also just sick of being there. It's been going on for days and days and everybody's staying in hotels and hotels are expensive and they're ready to go back home. So as time goes on, they just sort of say, fine, how bad could this Warren G. Harding guy be? It's amazing to me how much uh, sometimes a rumor that somebody starts can actually like change the course of a presidential election. Like if you think back to 1972 and Hunter S. Thompson started a rumor that uh, Ed Muskie had been on Ibogaine and was a drug addict and that sunk his entire campaign against, I believe that was Nixon. I want to delve into that story, Tony. I, I That's a sidebar. I really don't think we can go into it, but that does sound fascinating. I have no idea of this story prior to you mentioning it. I have so many questions. We do need to stay the course right, I will, on Warren G. Harding. I might, I might have to make an episode about that someday. We'll see. I would love to hear it if it's actually a bad idea. Maybe, maybe it was a good idea to torpedo him. No idea. <laughs> It would have been a good idea for somebody to torpedo Warren G. Harding, though, because what nobody knew at the time was that Warren G. Harding had a massive pile of skeletons in his closet. Warren G. Harding was a married man, and he had been married to Florence Kling in 1891. In some senses, it was a good match. Warren G. Harding ran a newspaper in Marion, Ohio, and when he fell ill, Florence was able to take the reins of the newspaper and run it so well that some people said afterwards that Warren was only a front for Florence's superior skill. In fact, the person who says that, interestingly enough, is another person who will go on to be a presidential candidate who worked at the same newspaper. A lot of goings on. 
at this tiny town's newspaper that would eventually make it to the national stage. And the idea that Florence was sort of the woman behind the man, that she was actually the one with ideas and pulling strings and maybe surpassed Warren in intellect and drive for power was a narrative that would be repeated, whether or not it was true, all the way up to the White House. People like to like to push those types of rumors. It's like the old ideas about like Dick Cheney and stuff like that, where they just they they like the person behind the that's really pulling the strings. She she may not have been the sole reason for Warren G. Harding's success, but she didn't hurt him. She was very much a savvy, calculating kind of person. Not in like a negative way, but able to at least see the pros and cons and pick the pros over the cons most of the time. So, Warren G. Harding gets sick, and it brings out Florence's true nature as this person who's very capable and able to do the kinds of things that her husband is doing, and maybe even do them better than he is. But Florence gets sick a little bit later, and this brings out a little bit more of Warren G. Harding's true nature. Because in 1905, while his wife is having major kidney problems and being treated by a homeopathy doctor... This is not an episode about homeopathy. Maybe another bad idea. Well, 1920s homeopathy was probably sometimes less dangerous than 20s hospitals. Yeah, and he did actually seem to do some stuff besides just have her drink water with infusions. But regardless, during this time of her sickness, he begins his longtime affair with his wife's close friend, Carrie Phillips. I feel like as bad of an idea as any affair is, like, there needs to be distance between <laughs> between the two of you so that there's not, like, they're not immediately right there all the time. The liabilities are huge. The liabilities are huge. She is also married, by the way. They are in a small town, so it's going to travel around, at least in rumors and gossip, that there's something going on here. That doesn't seem to have stopped Warren G. Harding are giving him much pause, but it's difficult to know exactly what the truth is about his relationships. You could ask, was he maybe distant from his wife at this point and feeling the need for some kind of actual love and companionship? Is he driven into Miss Carrie Phillips arms or is the fact that he is a philanderer and we'll get to some more philandering later is that what has made the rift between him and his wife and he's just continuing to act this out? Does Carrie Phillips love Warren G. Harding? Or is she kind of using him as a springboard to get some more stuff that she wants? She'll definitely be getting things from him later, but there's a lot about this that's kind of mushy. The one thing you definitely can know though is that Warren wrote to Carrie a lot hundreds of letters, many of them dozens of pages long, constantly professing his true and undying love for her. And we know this because Carrie saved many of these letters, despite Warren's frequent warnings that she should destroy them. We also know that Carrie wasn't Warren's only affair. In 1914, while he continued to write impassioned letters to her, he also hired a young woman named Nan Britton as his secretary and began a relationship with her as well. His relationship with Carrie was a little bit more proper since at least she was kind of close to his age. Nan Britton was in her 20s at this point and Warren G. Harding is 40s into 50s when he's carrying on with her. Yeah, it's a little bit of a gap. Yep. Shortly after this, Warren G. Harding makes it to the Senate. He has previously been a newspaper man. He parlays that into political influence and ultimately becomes a senator. And shortly after that, America enters World War I. Warren manages to keep Nan a secret from Carrie and keeps both women concealed from public knowledge for a while, although his affair with Carrie Phillips was an open secret in their hometown. But things go bad when Carrie finds out about Nan Britton. Now, it's worth pointing out, at this point in the story, Warren G. Harding's wife already knows that he has cheated on her with her friend, Carrie Phillips. 
she has thought about divorcing him, but decided ultimately not to. Her husband also probably knows about the affair and doesn't really do much about it. But Florence Harding at least had the benefit of knowing that she was still Warren G. Harding's wife, that she still had all the benefits that would come with being married to him, even if he wasn't faithful to her. Carrie Phillips cannot take this infidelity after all of these hundreds of letters of Warren G. Harding professing his undying, burning love for her. Now, all of a sudden, she finds out that he's got some young thing also on the side, and she comes after Warren G. Harding. It's a lot of evidence, too. It's rough. She has mountains of evidence, and she's already kind of mad at him before she finds this out. She doesn't want him to go into public life. She's really put off by the fact that he is entering politics because she knows that if he enters politics, there is no chance for their relationship to become legitimate. He has in the past promised her, I'm going to leave my wife and marry you and we'll run off to Hawaii and be happy together. You know, like, like you do when you're in this kind of situation. And now he's becoming a senator and there's absolutely no way in 1914 America that they're going to put up with a man divorcing his wife and running off with the next door neighbor. So she's, she's got that against him. She's also a staunch supporter of Germany, which was an interesting side, which was an interesting angle that I hadn't really considered before about this era of America that there were a lot of people in America who were pretty pro Germany in world war one. And it's, important to remember that world war one is not world war two germany while they did do some bad stuff in world war one was not the obvious evil empire that you're able to make them out as in world war two yeah but they had pointy helmets so you know you got to be against them (laughs) but it was very much like listen they've got their dictatorship there's a bunch of other countries that have their governments they're just looking to get some land there's no reason to support one over the other. It's just another war. What's the big deal? Why do you got to be hating on Germany? That was the kind of sentiment that some people had. It did get pretty tamped down on after America entered the war and the Sedition Act was passed. But Carrie Phillips keeps writing these sentiments to Warren G. Harding in her letters, so much so that the intelligence community actually finds out about this affair and investigates Carrie Phillips as a potential German spy. They think maybe there's an influence campaign going on that Carrie Phillips is working for Germany and trying to influence this American senator that she's having a relationship with. Turned out not to be true, but there's definitely a divide happening there. So when the Nan Britain bomb drops, it breaks this already fragile relationship all into pieces. Now, Warren G. Harding had already been supporting Carrie's lavish tastes in clothing and culture, and it's difficult to tell if that was the result of blackmail. It could have been one of those situations where he knows that she can hurt him real bad, and he does have feelings for her, so why not send a few thousand dollars every once in a while her way? grease the wheels make her happy she doesn't want to go to the press she still wants to have the sexy times with you is it blackmail if it's just the implication of blackmail and you don't have to say it well again it's dicey as to whether there was any actual coercion going on or whether warren would have given it to her anyway or whether he just knew there could be coercion but now it does actually tip into blackmail carrie's like you will give me money or I will go public. He offers her $5,000 a year, which is about $63,000 in today's money, for her silence. But she counteroffers and says, nah, it's not enough. Go higher. And Warren, at this point in the negotiation, is coming up on that Republican National Convention I mentioned earlier. And he says to Carrie Phillips, Carrie, I know you're mad. I don't have enough money to give you what you want right now. But if I can get nominated to be the presidential candidate for the Republican Party, 
I will have access to much, much more money. <laughs> Hang on. Let's see if this thing works out. And lo and behold, that thing worked out. Warren G. Hardy secures the presidential nomination. Nobody in the upper echelons of the Republican Party has any idea that he has this thing going on. But they find out pretty quickly afterwards. Because once Warren G. Hardy was the official nominee, Kerry Phillips comes knocking on their door and says, Hey, I've got all these letters. Your boy ain't going to win if I publish these letters. Make a deal with me. I feel like in modern politics, like that dice roll would just be like, well, you can leak it now. That's fine. Do you know what? Beyond the the change in morals, do you know what made the election of 1920 special that you would really not want? It leaked that the man who was running for president had not been faithful to his wife. Suffrage? Women's suffrage had just, just passed. Like, after the convention, by the way, Warren G. Harding (laughs) doesn't know during the convention that women are going to be able to vote. There are women delegates, not for the very first time, but it's, you know, still pretty revolutionary that there would be women here participating in the political machinations of the party. And so there is not really a solid understanding of how women are going to vote. And there's the very understandable fear that they're not going to be cool with the man cheating on his wife. Yeah. My civics teacher taught us that Warren G. Harding won because he was more attractive, and that's how how we got the worst president in history. I don't know if that's true. I think (laughs) that is an oversimplification. I think that he was implying it as an oversimplification, but he was just trying to get a rise out of some of the girls in the class. It's, it's possible that definitely had something to do with it. There is a Malcolm Gladwell smear on Warren G. Harding about how he just got elected because he looked like a president. And it's more complicated than that. He's almost just lucked into it. It's not even that he looks like a president. It, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of just like, fine, well, we got to put somebody up and everybody else can't agree on anybody else. So Warren G. Harding is just sort of the default We'll go to McDonald's, I guess, because we can't agree on the restaurant we want. So, Carrie Phillips is coming to the Republican Party with her demands, and the problem falls into the lap of Republican National Committee Chairman Will Hayes. This, by the way, is the Hayes of the Hayes Code, which might also be a future bad idea. I haven't studied it. But Will Hayes says to Carrie Phillips... We will deal with you. Here's what we've got. $25,000. But here's how you got to spend it. You have to go on vacation to Japan. Okay? Put the Pacific Ocean between you and us. And don't talk to any newspaper reporters. Between now and November, there won't be many of them over there in Japan. We're also going to give you $2,000 a month to keep your mouth shut. It's not the worst deal I've heard, especially $19.20. So Carrie took the money and went away and successfully pulled off what, as far as I can tell, was one of the most successful blackmail attempts in American political history. She took the entire Republican Party to the bank. <laughs> I, I literally, in, in some cases, because Hayes actually ends up in debt Not personally, but he ends up as part of the Teapot Dome scandal taking some money from some oil baron as part of a scheme to try to pay off the debt that he incurs during this campaign. And you can't help but wonder if that debt might not quite have been as high if he hadn't been sending $2,000 a month to Carrie Phillips to be on vacation for all that time. Yep, because that's like having to throw $20,000 a month at somebody. It's just a lot. But the, the Teapot Dome scandal, we could definitely do an episode on someday if we ever like feel so inclined. Some of these political scandals get a little bit dry, but that one was a huge one. It was the biggest one up until Nixon happened. From a certain perspective, the payoff worked. Kerry goes away, hard in campaigns. He wins by the biggest margin anybody has ever won by in the two-party system setup. In a time whenever nobody wanted him. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. 
Well, again, once he's in there, he's the Republican candidate, so they're all going to vote for him. And he just sort of had this like, hey, everybody, we've just been through World War One. Why don't we go be normal again? And everybody's like, yeah, let's be normal again. World War One sucked, didn't it? It's funny that whenever that's all you got to do, it's just like the return to normalcy, my presidency, nothing exciting, no wars, just chilling. So from that perspective, the ploy worked, Tony, but his sins would find him out eventually. When he died three years into his term, his secrets started to come to light. You'll remember I mentioned a woman named Nan Britton earlier. Well, she tried the same blackmail thing that Carrie Phillips tried, but since Warren was dead and his wife already knew about all this stuff, she wasn't coughing up any money. He kind of glossed over that, by the way. <laughs> You're just what? like, oh yeah, and in the second year of his presidency, he just died. Like, we didn't do what happened to him? Uh, he had a heart problem. It's possible that the quack doctor that treated his wife way back in 1905 was giving him too much x lax and that made things worse but uh he just died there's there there was like maybe his wife killed him kind of rumors but that, that none of that was ever substantiated he had like a hollywood death he's like sick on his bed and you know his wife is there tending to him possibly mopping his brow with a wet cloth and he just literally goes hur, hur, and like keels over it's it's the most Hollywood death for the most Hollywood dude you can imagine. As, <laughs> uh, as far as presidents, right? Like, he's a good-looking guy. He looks like a president. He, he has sort of the typical scandal-ridden presidency that you want to have in your Hollywood movie, and then he just sort of dies. I mean, I guess this makes the final season of House of Cards a little more plausible. In the absence of bribery money, Nan Britton published... The tell-all book, The President's Daughter, detailing her sexual liaisons with Warren G. Harding and alleging that the daughter that she bore after those sexual liaisons was, in fact, Warren G. Harding's daughter. And this was confirmed in 2014 with DNA evidence. Warren G. Harding had a daughter with Nan Britton. It was thought that he was actually not able to have kids because he didn't with any of the other women that he was with. But, uh... Turns out, Nan Britton, tell him the truth, at least for some of this. Yeah, he, life finds a way. And later, after Carrie Phillips' death, his many letters to her would be revealed to the world for all to see. And for all the seeming good fortune and careful image management that got him elected, his reputation would ultimately fall to pieces. Not only because of his womanizing, but... As we mentioned earlier, his presidency was plagued by rampant political corruption that would ultimately culminate in the Teapot Dome scandal. And today, he is frequently ranked by historians as the worst president of all time. And it's kind of interesting. From what I was reading, he was pretty well liked while he was president. And then once everything was revealed, people were just kind of done with it. There was so much corruption happening. At Warren G. Harding himself seemed like the kind of guy who was like, I don't like this corruption, but if it's for my party and it gets us elected, I guess we'll do it anyway because they're going to do it. And there was a lot of stuff, I think, that changed after this uh, as far as how corruption was handled. There, This was very much the heyday of the smoke-filled room and the political kingmakers kind of having sway. I mean, you go back to the original part of the story where one guy is able to say they're going to support a candidate from within the party and everybody's just like, all right, that's cool. <laughs> like it isn't even true. It's just so believable that that would happen that everybody just falls in line with it. But that is all we have on Warren G. Harding. I, I wanted to do this episode because I never heard this story before. I'd never heard this episode of the blackmail the idea of one woman blackmailing the entire Republican Party at this crucial point and getting the uh, arguably the worst president ever elected into office really was an interesting tale that I thought I didn't know and I, I didn't think a lot of our listeners might have known. So I hope that you've learned something interesting today. Yeah, because I'd heard about Teapot Dome. I'd heard about a lot of these other ones. I did not know that she basically just extorted the uh, Republican Party out of a bunch of cash. 
It's a great tale, isn't it? <laughs> it's fascinating. Uh, don't cheat on your wife. That's the bad idea for me. Just don't <laughs> don't cheat on your wife. Don't if you're going to cheat on your wife, don't cheat on the woman you're cheating with. And then send her a bunch of letters and then go into politics where those letters could be ultra super damaging. <laughs> just just a whole cascade of things you shouldn't do. Yeah. Maybe you could focus on being a better president if you didn't have three mistresses. That is all we have for this week. We really appreciate you guys for listening. If you enjoyed this and you want to help us make more of these, you should go over to Patreon at patreon.com slash human echoes, uh, where not only can you get access to this podcast a week earlier than everybody else now, but you can also hear the bonus podcast, uh, which is where we just sort of talk about stuff. Yeah, we get um, off topic and that's all four of us from human echoes too. Yes, we're just kind of free-forming it. It's a great time, most of the time, until we get to arguing. <laughs> Starts at $1, goes up from there. So if you do that, you can also get pins, shirts, all sorts of fun stuff. And we will talk to you guys next week with more bad ideas. Bye, guys!